Hey, Marty. Hi, Alan. Hey, Rabbi. Hey, good evening. Good evening. How are you, Marvin Carroll? And Leon. Good evening, Rabbi. Yeah, By the way, on. I have met. Uh, good evening, sir. And shook his hand and chatted with him in small talk. Who's that? Harry Truman? Yes. And, okay. Uh, this Wasn't is, sure if you meant Alan. After he left uh, <laughs> the, the office, uh, he was in the Truman Library. He had an office there, and I met him at the library. So uh, he said hi, and he said hi, Marv. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I was I admired him because I knew it took a lot of courage from him to authorize the atomic bomb, and he said, "Well, we saved millions of lives by doing that." So. Some agree with that and some disagree with that, but that's the life of politicians. Right. Well, Truman is an interesting guy. As uh, as we will talk about very shortly. Let's see. Well, always a few folks who uh, come on a little late, so. Uh, by the way, if anybody is looking for um, a good film to watch, it's not available <clears throat> on a DVD. Um, I think if you have Amazon, if you have Prime, you could get it. Uh, let me see. Looking at it before. Uh, it's narrated by Morgan Freeman. So that was two years ago. What is it? No. Let's see if I can find it. It won an Academy Award. Um All right, well, I'm not finding it now, but ah, okay, the long way home. Uh, it's the documentary examining um, Jewish refugees after uh, World War II. And uh, the, there are various battles with immigration restrictions to this country. And um, uh, so Morgan Freeman is the narrator. Um, it also... Um, it features Israel Lau, who later went on to become uh, a chief rabbi of Israel, who was a survivor. Famous picture of uh, of him um, at Buchenwald. And uh, anyway, you can um, you can get it on Amazon. It was uh, came out in '97, and it was a uh, it won the um, 
won an Academy Award for Best Documentary. So, so a lot of what's in there we'll, we'll be touching on uh, this evening. So I guess we'll get started. If other people are, uh, are running a little late, they'll just have to uh, jump in. Um, so before we uh, go back to uh, Harry S. Truman's early life, and as some of you I'm sure know, the S stood for nothing. <laughs> it was just Harry S. Truman. But um, FDR uh, had not made um, any kind of unequivocal commitment uh, to the establishment of the Jewish state. One of the things I talked about is FDR was famous for telling you what you wanted to hear. And if your opponent came in 15 minutes later, he had no problem telling you the exact, you know, telling your, your, your opponent uh, on whatever issue, the exact opposite. Uh, David Niles, who was an assistant both to FDR uh, and to Truman, uh, he was an advisor on Jewish affairs. Uh, commented seriously that if Roosevelt had not died in office, if Roosevelt had lived uh, through his fourth term, uh, and that would have been until the inauguration in the spring of uh, 49, uh, he doesn't know that there would have been a state of Israel. Roosevelt certainly was not unequivocally committed to it, um, quite the opposite we really don't know what Roosevelt would have done. But if we do know some of the obstacles that um, existed at the end of the war and with Britain and in the United Nations and some of the obstacles FDR himself had encountered when he met with King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia, um, it's likely that he would not have gone out on a limb, which is what Truman did. So one of the difficulties is uh, Harry Truman really um, had to step up to the plate in a way that he was not prepared for. Uh, Truman had been in the Senate for nine years. Before that, his political office had been strictly local. And when he, um, when he was put on the ticket as vice president, um, it was done not because of what Truman was, but more about what Truman wasn't, right? FDR's previous vice president was Henry Wallace, um, a real flaming liberal. In fact, he had his own presidential run uh, which was not uh, successful, but he really was quite liberal and made some of the stalwarts of the uh, Democratic Party um, who were more to the right, very uncomfortable. They wanted somebody whom they felt would just be quiet and mind his own business. And they picked Harry Truman because they felt that he would be kind of a mediocrity that would just be sort of window dressing. And that would be that. Roosevelt, who was already in his uh, you know, fourth term, didn't have much use for Truman. Uh, in the whole time from the election in the fall of 44 to his death, to FDR's death in April of 45, uh, he only had two private meetings with Truman. Truman was not routinely invited into FDR's inner circles. So he was largely in the dark about FDR's dealings, uh, his intentions. He knew nothing about the atomic bomb until he uh, stepped into the presidency. You know, FDR had said nothing to him. So if you can imagine, you know, somebody who was not very well versed and prepared, uh, Truman's learning curve was quite steep. And 
I think from uh, the perspective of uh, 70 years on, um, he did he did a lot better than than most people would have given him credit for. Um, um, in, in fact, he, he made any number of courageous decisions. Uh, often, you know, uh, under tremendous amounts of pressure. And he truly was, at the end of the day, uh, his own man. Didn't mean that he couldn't be swayed. He could be. But um, when he made a decision, he went ahead and he, he stuck by his guns, uh, even if it did uh, cost him. Um, the uh, the atomic bomb was one, though that was um, you know ultimately at the time a popular decision. Um, the uh, uh, he he lost a great deal of support uh, from um, the China lobby, uh, who felt that he had given away uh, mainland China to the the communists, which he hadn't. Uh, China and Chiang Kai Shek were rotten to the core. Nobody could have propped up that regime. Um, and of course, when it came to firing MacArthur, right, it was a very, very tough move politically to fire MacArthur. But um, he didn't want World War III, not over North Korea. And um, he was right. So that all being said, uh, Truman, despite having this huge learning curve, uh, really um, came to, into his own in the presidency. So what do we know about Harry S. Truman? Well, he was raised as a Baptist. He was the grandson of Missouri slave owners. <laughs> um, he remained religiously active throughout his life. Uh, you know, he, he, he was not a, um, a shrinking wallflower. He certainly um, had a robust vocabulary for, uh, um, let's say, for expressions of, uh, uh, for, you know, he liked his curse words. Um, but he went to church every Sunday. He read his Bible and he knew his Bible uh, backward and, and, and forward. He grew up in Independence, Missouri, uh, just outside of Kansas City. And after high school, um, he never graduated from college. He, I believe, was the last president who didn't have a college degree. Um, he had actually gone to um, law school. You could do that in those days. Uh, law was a trade, a vocation, and you didn't necessarily, if you uh, did the entrance exams, you didn't necessarily have to have a, a BA. Uh, he had hoped to go to West Point. Um, but his eyesight was bad, he was rejected. He was, however, able to join the Missouri National Guard. How? He memorized the eye chart. <laughs> he found out what eye chart he was, they were using and he memorized it, he got into uh, the National Guard. Uh, Truman was an avid reader all of his life. I mean, he had a very active mind and though um, not polished, not intellectual, um, he was quite well read and to the end of his life, I mean, spent um, a good part of every day reading, including um, reading cover to cover four or five different newspapers uh, each morning. Uh, during World War I, despite being over the age of conscription, he was 33, uh, he volunteered for the AEF, the American Expeditionary Force, he became a captain of artillery and he rose to the rank of major by war's end. Now, the relationship that everybody likes to talk about uh, regarding Harry Truman is with a fellow named Eddie Jacobson. Uh, Eddie Jacobson is uh, also from Kansas City, from that area. Uh, he's a sergeant in World War I and he's in Truman's outfit. Uh, Jacobson helps Truman in running the regimental canteen. That's how they meet. And he had pre-war experience in retail. And um, unlike most of the other 
regimental canteens that lost money, a uh, Truman's canteen turned a profit, right, which uh, he credited Eddie Jacobson with to a, a, a large uh, degree. Uh, so this was the beginning of a lifelong uh, friendship between these two Missourians, Eddie Jacobson and um, uh, uh, Harry S. Truman. So they became partners after the war in a haberdashery business. Let me, I uh, wanna share this photo. Let's see, do that. All right, hopefully everybody can see this. All right, there's Harry Truman. You know, hopefully you can all see the photo. Uh, Eddie Jacobson is not in this picture. This is about 1920. Uh, the haberdashery, which was called uh, Truman and Jacobson, was um, in a pretty fashionable area of Kansas City. It was on West 12th and Baltimore, right across from um, a uh, fancy hotel. And I don't remember uh, which. I bet Greg Arnold, if he were on this evening would. But in any event, um, there's Harry Truman. Uh, Truman put up the money and um, Eddie Jacobson had the expertise in retail. It didn't matter that, um, you know, that they were uh, in a good place. It, it, for whatever reason, I don't know, exactly why, but the business went bankrupt after two years. Um, Truman lost a, a lot of money, but he, he was already um, a, a county judge at that point and was, was um, uh, protected against bankruptcy. Uh, Eddie Jacobson, um, so most of the money that was lost though was Truman's. Um, later on, uh, Truman would, uh, um, or rather, uh, Jacobson would actually, when he when he did well later on in life, he did become successful. He he actually uh, uh, paid Truman back um, for his his share. So um, I'm going to show a, a little clip. Uh, this is um, Harry Truman uh, talking about prejudice against Jews, but it's it's. Particularly interesting because he uh, he talks about Eddie Jacobson in it, and I'm going to uh, put that up. Whoops, let's see, find it. Let's see. Okay, back here. Ooh. All right, share the screen. Okay, here we go. And I'm just going to optimize share. All right. Here we go. I found in the United States a lot of bigotry and opposition to Jews as such, which I could never understand for the simple reason that the Jewish people gave us our moral code entirely. And I had a, a partner when I first got out of the uh, White House and moved back to Kansas City, a uh, fellow by the name of Eddie Jacobson. And he and I started a haberdashery store and we went broke and lost a lot of money. I, I furnished the money and Eddie furnished the know-how. But when we went broke, why, they forced Eddie into bankruptcy. They couldn't put me into bankruptcy because I was on the county court. That was uh, long before I was president of the United States. I said it was afterwards, but it was before. And of course, when the thing was all over and Eddie became prosperous after that, he met his share of those losses and 
That's my idea of a good do. Okay, well, that's his idea of a good Jew. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, it's interesting that he segues from uh, condemning prejudice against Jews to Eddie Jacobson. Uh, but, you know, I, there weren't that many Jews that Harry Truman was close to, especially from uh, growing up or the time that, not growing up, but the time that he was young. And uh, so invariably, well, we'll get back to Eddie Jacobson. We'll see that, in fact, uh, Jacobson plays a, uh, an important role uh, in, uh, in Truman and, and uh, recognition of the state of Israel. But uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So that kind of gives you some flavor. You know, so Truman, um, you know, is condemning. This was long after he was president condemning anti-Semitism, the Jews gave us our, you know, the moral code for Western civilization and commandments, et cetera. Reminds me of uh, my old partner, Eddie Jacobson, right? Even though he didn't have to pay me back later on, he did. And that's my idea of a good Jew, not just a good person, you know, but a good Jew. But, uh, and, and that becomes actually, um, you know, uh, important when we, when we consider uh, a not so nice side uh, of uh, of Harry S. Truman. So um, Truman, by the way, um, one of the ironies of of history is that in the 1944 campaign, uh, people castigated Truman, um, anti-Semites, you know, linking his name to Eddie Jacobson. Oh, he had a Jewish partner. So, uh, you know, he, he's, he uh, got some, um, some flack during the 44 campaign as vice president uh, because of his former association with Eddie Jacobson, also because his grandfather's name was Solomon. Maybe he was part Jewish. Uh, what Truman said at the time in response was that he wasn't Jewish, but if he were, uh, he'd never be ashamed of it. Now, in private, um, he would refer to Jews as kikes. And in 2003, a portion of his diary was, uh, he had written in the back of a book on uh, commercial real estate. Apparently there was uh, empty space in the back and he had used it as a kind of diary. And, they, and so nobody knew that it had been there, but it was found by one of the archivists at the National Archives. And so he wrote, and now, Granted, this is not for public consumption. This was just him, you know, he was blowing off steam and confiding to his own notes. But this is what he wrote. The Jews I find are very, very selfish, right? Uh, this was written on July 21st, 1947, after the president had a conversation with Henry Morgenthau Jr., right? Who had been FDR's good friend, uh, and, and was formerly the Treasury Secretary under FDR, uh, and at the beginning of, uh, of Truman's uh, tenure in office. Morgenthau had called to talk about a, a Jewish ship. This is during the era of uh, Ali Abet, illegal uh, immigration to Israel, right? The British were not letting Jews in. There were lots and lots of boats. We've all seen um, um, you know, the movie Exodus which is very moving. I never had known before that Paul Newman was a refugee uh, seeking to get into, uh, uh, into uh, British Palestine. Um, okay, not, but, but anyway, successful movie, uh, less successful um, historical event. Um, so Morgenthau, who took on a much higher level of Jewish involvement after he left uh, the cabinet. He was a president of uh, Israel Bonds, I believe, and I think he was the president of JNF. I mean, he was he was involved in Jewish causes. Um, so Morgenthau reaches out to uh, to Truman to to push, you know, Truman on uh, on probably the Exodus because that was the highest profile. Uh, but there were lots of boats and a lot of attempts to uh, to smuggle Jews 
uh, out of the DP camps and into, uh, into Palestine. But uh, continuing, this is what Truman said about Morgenthau. He had no business whatever to call me. The Jews have no sense of proportion, nor do they have any judgment on world affairs. Henry brought a thousand Jews to New York on a supposedly temporary basis, and they stayed. Right, that's a reference to uh, to this. I think we uh, looked at that picture uh, last time, but I'll put it up. Let's see, we are. And screen share this. Okay. These are those refugees that FDR in 1944 the thousand mostly Jewish refugees that were brought uh, to um, Fort Ontario in upstate New York, Oswego, New York, on the shores of Lake Ontario. Uh, they had to sign documents stating that they were prepared to return to Europe after the war was over. They did, what choice did they have? None of them wanted to be repatriated. There was nothing left. Their, their homes, their families, their communities were, were destroyed. Um, so, uh, eventually, so it wasn't really, I mean, Henry Morgenthau did, did push for this, but it was FDR who invited them, quote unquote, as his guests, not Morgenthau. Um, and it was Truman actually who allowed them to stay. Uh, so, um, that being said, uh, he went on to, uh, to say in his diary, the Jews I find are very, very selfish. They care not how many Estonians, Latvians, Finns, Poles, Yugoslavs, or Greeks get mur murdered or mistreated as uh, displaced persons, as long as the Jews get special treatment. Yet when they have power, physical, financial, or political, neither Hitler nor Stalin has anything on them for cruelty or mistreatment to the underdog. That's, that's pretty... Uh, Wow, <laughs> that's strong stuff. Put an underdog on top and it makes no difference whether his name is Russian, Jewish, Negro, management, labor, Mormon, Baptist, he goes haywire. I have found very, very few who remember their past condition when prosperity comes, end quote. Um, I mean, look, there's, there's nothing defensible about this. The fact that he uh, expressed it privately is better than his having expressed it publicly. I mean, as a politician, um, I I have to imagine that Truman, in a moment of less ire, would have, you know, seen the the absolute uh, injustice of saying, um, you know, that you could compare Jews to Hitler or Stalin. Um, and by being you know, cruel or mistreating the underdog. Perhaps the reference here is to, uh, to events in, in Palestine, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, uh, Truman had too, too much seichel to know, you know, to believe differently. So one can only imagine that there was a lot of frustration and we'll see it, 1947 was a year that Truman squirmed a lot for a variety of reasons and had a lot of pressure on him from the Zionist world. Uh, in a memoir written by uh, David Wallace, who was uh, not, not the novelist, but um, Bess Wallace Truman, Wallace was Bess Truman's maiden name, uh, David Wallace, he acknowledges his grandmother's anti-Semitism, right? Um, Bess Wallace's mother. Uh, which apparently Bess maintained. Um, no Jewish neighbors or friends were allowed into her home. By the way, Truman, when they got married, uh, they moved into the, the Wallace home. So uh, Bess and, uh, and Harry uh, lived in um, her parents' home, e even after uh, her parents, uh, well, her, her father committed suicide, uh, but after uh, her, her mother died. But uh, Bess Wallace's mother didn't allow Jews into the house. And that was true even of uh, Harry Truman's closest friends, right? Uh, army buddy and, you know, 
and partner Eddie Jacobson uh, was not allowed into the house. The White House, yes, but not into the Wallace home. Uh, much later on in the early 1960s, David Susskind, who is Jewish, was Jewish, uh, produced a, a series of Truman television interviews. And he too, I guess if Jenny, Andy Jacobson wasn't going to make it in, uh, Susskind wasn't, he got as far as the Truman Homes unheated vestibule. And they would go elsewhere, but you know, not in the house. So Susskind once asked, you know, why, why he was never invited inside. And Truman said, David, this is not the White House. It is the Wallace House. Bess runs it. And there's never been a Jew inside the house in her or her mother's lifetime. Uh, David Wallace, that's Wallace Truman's nephew, wrote, my aunts had no problem with Jewish people, certainly my uncle didn't. So I've never figured out why when my grandmother died in 1952, my Aunt Bess continued that policy that Susskind encountered. So these are not um, pleasant things. They're not complimentary things. Um, uh, on the other hand, we have to look at them in you know, a larger perspective because Truman's personal foibles or peak uh, or uh, irritation uh, has to be weighed against his public actions, which largely uh, redounded to the benefit of the Jewish people. Uh, one scholar, John Lewis Gaddis, he's a professor of history at Yale and a prominent scholar of the Cold War. Uh, he comments, Truman was often critical, sometimes hypercritical of Jews in his diary entries and in his correspondence, but this doesn't make him an anti-Semite. Anyone who played the role he did in creating the state of Israel can hardly be regarded in that way. I don't know if that's overstating it, but Truman, um, certainly whatever his private prejudices uh, in, in a more public role, um, did not shy away from contact with Jews or, or uh, making decisions um, sometimes quite courageously so uh, in favor of uh, the Jewish people. So before we take a, a look at, at Truman, um, we're going to look at Truman and refugee policy, and then we're going to get to uh, Truman, Zionism, and Israel. But I want to stop and ask if any folks have some questions about anything I've said up to this point. It has to do with Truman's policies as president with refugees in Israel. We'll get to that in a bit, but Truman's personal anti-Semitism, his relationship with Eddie Jacobson, Huh? Okay. Do uh, right. you know anything about Bess uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, Harry Truman had uh, Jews in his cabinet. Mm -hmm. Um, Truman did not. Oh, he didn't? Mm -mm. He had advisors. And he, Morgenthau was not in his cabinet? Well, Morgenthau, he inherited Morgenthau, Secretary of the yeah. Treasury, but um, Truman appointed his, his own fellow. Uh, Morgenthau retired. I, I don't remember what she, what year, but I mean, but it was not um, when it came to public matters. You know, Truman. Some of what we've seen from his private affairs uh, didn't seem to you know make itself felt in his public affairs. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that Truman. You know. He, he, he found the people that he wanted for his cabinet. I don't think he deliberately sought to circumvent Jews. And there were plenty of others whom he, um, you know, in, in other capacities that he had a relationship with. All right, so let's talk about Truman and refugees. Uh, just two days after he took the presidency, he gave a speech, and this is what Truman said. Merely talking about the four freedoms is not enough, right? Um, FDR had these four freedoms, which also became a part of his vision leading to the United Nations, you know, freedom of 
fear, uh, freedom, um, freedom from fear, freedom of want, um, freedom of uh, government, and I'm trying to remember what the fourth freedom is. Um, I don't know, freedom, um, I'm not sure that was freedom of worship, freedom of association or uh, freedom of expression. Um, I'd have to go back and look. So, but anyway, merely talking about the four freedoms is not enough. This is the time for action. No one can any longer doubt the intentions of the Nazi beasts. We know that they plan the systematic slaughter throughout all of Europe, not only of the Jews, but of vast numbers of other innocent peoples. Their oppressors must know they will be held directly accountable for their bloody deeds. To do all this, we must draw deeply on our traditions of aid to the oppressed and on our great national generosity. This is not a Jewish problem. It is an American problem. And we must and we will face it squarely and honorably. Now, FDR you know, typically did not talk like this. He certainly, when Truman made this uh, front and center, right after his elevation to the presidency, um, a public statement, that, that was something of a departure. Not that FDR didn't say these things, but not as bluntly. Now, would he have? I, I don't know. It's one of those what ifs. But going on the record, hard, hard to say. Um, in late 45, press reports begin to appear about poor conditions in the DP camps, right, the displaced person camps. Keep in mind, many of these DP camps weren't DP camps, they were just concentration camps that had been turned into displaced person camps, right? So Buchenwald was now a, uh, um, you know, uh, in the American zone was a DP camp. Um, they were there. They weren't going to be, you know, they hadn't created other places for them to go. And uh, Truman sends Earl Harrison, Earl Harrison is the Dean of the law school at, at UFP, University of Pennsylvania, to investigate the DP camps. And Harrison's report is damning. Um, he notes that German prisoners of war were treated better than the survivors living in, in the camps. Truman uh, is deeply disturbed by Harrison's report and he writes to Eisenhower um, endorsing the report, but then he goes on, he goes on to say this, this is Truman's words to Eisenhower. We must intensify our efforts to get these people out of camps and into decent houses until they can be repatriated or evacuated. These houses should be requisitioned from the German civilian population. That is one way to implement the Potsdam policy that the German people cannot escape responsibility for what they have brought upon themselves. Truman had gone to Potsdam um, right after the war was over, July of 45, met with uh, a Churchill, and with uh, Stalin, uh, and they had a declaration on a number of things, but one of the things that they declared is that the German people, as a people, had to accept responsibility for uh, the, the, the results of uh, the Holocaust and their persecution of others. Uh, then he goes on to quote from the Harrison Report. As matters now stand, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. They are in concentration camps in large numbers under our military guard instead of SS troops. One is led to wonder whether the German people seeing this are not supposing that we are following or at least condoning Nazi policy. Right? Those aren't Truman's words, he's quoting from the Harrison report. But then Truman goes on. I know you will agree with me that we have a particular responsibility toward these victims of persecution and tyranny who are in our zone. 
We must make clear to the German people that we thoroughly abhor the Nazi policies of hatred and persecution. We have no better opportunity to demonstrate this than by the manner in which we ourselves actually treat the survivors remaining in Germany. I am communicating directly with the British government in an effort to have the doors of Palestine opened to such of these displaced persons as wish to go there. Eisenhower, in response to the Harrison report and you know, Truman's um, sense of urgency, creates an advisor on Jewish affairs uh, on his staff uh, and appoints uh, a chaplain, um, Rabbi Judah Nadich, uh, he's a conservative rabbi for Dame of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, Nadich goes on and later becomes the, uh, the spiritual leader of the Park Avenue Synagogue uh, in New York. Uh, Nadich is, uh, is charged with visiting all the DP camps in the US zone of occupation in Germany and to make specific recommendations directly to Eisenhower uh, or his chief of staff, Walter Bettelsmith. Um, and indeed, because of this, uh, conditions begin to improve in the DP camps. But, you know, a DP camp is still. A DP camp. So while Truman um, is busy trying to improve the quality of life uh, in the displaced person camps, he issues an executive order in December of 1945 against a lot of opposition in Congress to address the refugee situation. And this executive order uh, sets forth that the immigration quotas for 1946, right? They are enshrined in law. You can't, you know, unilaterally cancel congressional legislation. But that the immigration quotas for 1946 give preference to victims of Nazi persecution, who are in the U.S. zones of occupation at the time of uh, the executive order. So there were many members of Congress, as I said, who opposed even the smallest number of Jewish immigrants. Um, and the executive order, um, you know, overrode um, a lot of this congressional obst obstructionism. Um, we had talked, I think, last time about the likely to become a public charge uh, requirement. Right, if, if you were likely to become a public charge, you were not uh, allowed to immigrate to the United States, you know, unless you had rich relatives guaranteeing you. Here, of course, people who are in the DP camps have nothing, right? They have no assets. Uh, but Truman's executive order completely set this aside, specifying instead that. Um, the likely to become a public charge would be waived uh, because not-for-profit groups like the NCJW, National Council of Jewish Women, and HIAS, Hebrew uh, Immigrant Aid Society, uh, have committed to providing funds for setting up immigrants who arrived in the U.S. On the strength of those guarantees, that was waived completely. And that was Truman's doing. That was not uh, that was not Congress. Still, even after World War II, a lot of uh, xenophobia and nativism. Fast forward a little bit, and in June of 1948, Truman signs the Displaced Persons Act, which formally allows refugees to come to the U.S. So anyone who had been taken into Germany, Austria, or Italy, obviously not voluntarily, uh, between September 1st, 1939 and December 22nd, 1945. Um, and this also included those who had sought refuge in uh, the British, French, or US zones after the war, six months after the war, um, were to be given not only priority, but up to 200,000. 
right? So 100,000 a year, 200,000 for two years. And those being allowed in are, are counted toward the quota, the immigration quotas, but above and beyond them. In other words, to the extent the number of refugees allowed into the country exceeded the quota numbers, the numbers were charged against future quota years. But what it do, did was um, it gave refugees, 200,000 refugees, the right to emigrate. But the quota years for 1950, 51, 52, they were preempted to, to be used, right? You were like borrowing against the quotas of future years, mortgaging the quotas of future years to allow these refugees in now. Uh, it also allowed eligible displaced orphans in um, above and beyond non-quota immigration, up to 3,000. Truman was not 100% behind the, the Displaced Persons Act because he felt it was too restrictive. Uh, he was explicit in his criticisms. He signed it because he felt it was imperfect legislation, but it addressed a need. But he, he, um, he issued a statement when he, when he signed the Displaced Persons Act in 1948. So what were his objections? One, he didn't like the, the, that it took away previous immigration quota places from others already on the, uh, the waiting list. Right, so Truman wanted to allow refugees in outside the quota system, period. Have the quotas, which could go to, uh, to either others or even to refugees, but also have the 200,000 allowed in as refugees. He also felt that the uh, act discriminated against uh, Jewish displaced persons, specifically those uh, from Poland and the Soviet Union who hadn't yet reached Germany or, or Austria or Italy by December 22nd, 1945, right? There were lots of Jews all over the place. And the, the fluidity of movement across Europe in the months after the war and infrastructure was destroyed and people were walking um, and often starving and taking roundabout ways. Um, he felt that the the act did not sufficiently take into account Jewish DP, Jewish displaced persons who were in uh, Poland or the, Russia. Remember, there were those who managed to escape the Nazis by fleeing east. And many of them ended up in gulags or the functional equivalent, still better than you know extermination camps. But uh, to to make their way westward. Some of them did not, you know, assuming those, I mean, not everybody made it, but those who reached the Western occupation zones, not all of them got there by December 22nd, 1945. So these were the two things that he did not like about the Displaced Persons Act of 48. Uh, there was a revised Displaced Persons Act in 1950, which actually corrected these deficiencies. So the renewed legislation remedied uh, these issues. So when the act sunsetted in um, middle of 1952, almost 400,000 displaced persons had been admitted for resettlement into the US. Um, between the Truman Directive of 45 and the, uh, the Displaced Persons Act, it's estimated somewhere that between 130 and 140,000 Jews came to this country between the end of World War II and the early 1950s. So Truman, um, when it came to refugees, was uh, you know a far more sympathetic president, did far more than than FDR. Now. 
might FDR have done more after the war had been won? It's possible. We know that there were times when FDR you know, did a number of things for refugees. But um, also FDR, again, you know, was, a, was a, a, the consummate politician. But when he ran into headwinds, he tacked and didn't, you know, charge. Um, Truman, you know, was a little bit of an auction. Uh, he was stubborn. And if he felt something was right, for whatever reason, um, he did. So that's one of those what if questions. Truman certainly did um, more after the war than FDR did during. And it's not a fair comparison because the situations were different, but it's still some food for thought. Let me uh, stop here. We're gonna get to Truman in Israel, our last part for the evening. Um, but any uh, questions on Truman and refugees? The quota system, by the way, did not, you know, fully get trashed and, and discarded until uh, the 1960s, uh, until Johnson's presidency. So the quotas, you know, they were they were altered, they were tinkered with, but we had a quota system from 1924 to 1964. We still have that. In a different way, but yes. <laughs> well, absolutely. <laughs> By the way, the, four, right. fear, the four fears are uh, the four freedoms. Four freedoms are freedom from speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want. Right. And, okay. And freedom of need from need. And I think want and need were the same thing. Worship. Worship. Yeah. Worship, speech. I, I think uh, government, you had freedom of choice with, uh, you know, uh, anyway, we can go back and look. Um, but let me talk about Israel and Truman, because that's really a fascinating story. So uh, in the summer of 45, Truman, you know, endorses, wants Britain to lift restrictions on immigration of Jewish refugees to Palestine. Not completely, not open door, but he wants them to take a set amount. Um, 100,000, uh, but Clement Attlee, right, Churchill's successor, uh, who's the British prime minister, flatly refuses. The answer is no. But um, in, in uh, January of 46, uh, in part in response to this pressure put on uh, the British by Truman, there is an Anglo-American committee on, of inquiry on Palestine, which makes a number of recommendations. Uh, one of is that there, there, there should be one state, neither Jewish nor you know, Arab, um, but one of the recommendations is to allow 100,000 Jewish refugees in. British say, okay, you want 100,000 Jewish refugees? I'll tell you what, US. If you guarantee military assistance when the Arabs riot and revolt at 100,000 Jews allowed into the country, if the US will, will guarantee military assistance to help put down the violence, we'll allow 100,000 Jews in. The US said, look, we're not, you know, we're not going to make any military guarantees in this regard. Uh, and Britain said, okay, well, then I guess we're not allowing in 100,000 Jewish refugees. And they maintained the White Paper of 1939, which uh, uh, only allowed a trickle, very small number of Jews, right? Um, you read, you know, Leon Uris, or it's a, you know, uh, it, you know, Jews are, are, they're in DP camps. Um, many run by the British as they you know, are arrested, attempting to enter into, into uh, mandate Palestine. <coughs> Others are sent back uh, to Europe for their 
ports of uh, disembarkation, I guess embarkation, uh, original ports of embarkation. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, and there's violence in, uh, in Palestine itself, right? 1946 is when the Irgun blows up the King David or the a wing of the King David Hotel. There's violence uh, between um, Arabs and Jews. Uh, the British are getting it uh, from, from both sides. And um, they're also under a lot of pressure in, in India, right? Their, their empire has fallen apart and they barely survived the, the Second World War. Uh, so they're, you know, they're not in a great position to do anything. In February of 47, Britain says enough and it refers the issue of Palestine to the United Nations. Now that summer, the White House is flooded by 100,000 letters urging uh, Truman to support the Jewish state. American Zionists are hounding Truman. They really are. Um, meanwhile, he's under a significant amount of pressure from the State Department. They do not want Truman to support partition. They do not want Truman to recognize a Jewish state. Their concern of the impact on Arab relationships, right? Cold War is ramping up. Will this drive them into Soviet arms? And of course, the whole consideration of Arab oil as a strategic commodity. Uh, Secretary of State George Marshall, right? A great man, the Marshall Plan, um, but not a supporter of Jewish statehood. He was absolutely categorically opposed to it. Truman admired Marshall a great deal. So Marshall is putting pressure on Truman. Zionists are putting pressure on Truman from the opposite direction. And exasperated, you know, Truman refuses to meet with Zionist leaders, including Chaim Weizmann. It was felt that if, if Truman could only be exposed to Weizmann, Weizmann had a way, he had uh, helped charm the British government into the Balfour Declaration. But um, when it was asked of him to meet with Weizmann, he re his reported to have said, and this is you know classic uh, Harry Truman, Jesus Christ couldn't please them when he was on earth. So how could anyone expect that I would have any luck? So I, it made me chuckle because, I mean, you know, it's just Harry Truman. But um, Truman, however, did support, support the UN partition plan, despite the State Department's desire to, uh, to derail it. He even helped rally uh, votes to the cause. Um, now, some of the reason it passed was because of actually the Soviet Union and its, you know, satellite countries, all of the Soviet socialist republics who were, you know, part of the, uh, uh, that, that had their own votes in the, in the General Assembly. Um, but was not, what was unclear is what would happen on May 14th, 1948, right, the day the British mandate ended. And the British themselves, they abstained on the partition plan. And their, their, uh, their plan was to just on May 14th leave. It was chaos. They had no plans to transfer uh, certain things to um, the Jewish government in waiting, right? The Jewish agency, which was de facto the government. There was no Palestinian government because all of the Arabs, unilaterally and unequivocally rejected the partition plan. So it was left up to uh, individual commanders and in individual places to decide what to do with you know, British installations and forts. Um, they really lowered the Union Jack and, and hightailed it out. And this is where Eddie Jacobson comes into the picture. So sometime in 47, 
late 47, early 48. Uh, Jacobson asks for a meeting with Truman. All right, Truman's not going to turn uh, Jacobson down. Um, and it's the White House, not the Wallace House. I guess it's okay for him to come in. And But he does stipulate. He says, he, you can't talk about Zionism or Israel. You can come in. We can you know, talk about anything you want, Eddie, but not that. And Jacobson agrees. Now, um, Truman sees that Jacobson is distraught and his eyes are welling up with tears. And Truman says, Eddie, you son of a bitch, you promised you wouldn't say a word about what's going on over there. And Jacobson responds that he didn't say a word. But then he goes on to say, Harry, all your life, you've had a hero. You're probably the best read man in America on the life of Andrew Jackson. Interesting that Jackson is such a hero. Um, some of us today in a more enlightened age, Jackson has his problems, but he was also a man who really didn't care what people thought. He was plain spoken. So that was Harry Truman's hero. Well, I have a hero too, a man I've never met, but who is, I think, the greatest Jew who ever lived. I'm talking about Chaim Weizmann. He is an old and sick man. And he's come all the way to America to see you. Every time I think about it, I can't help crying. And Truman responds, Eddie, you son of a bitch, I ought to have you thrown out of here for breaking your promise. You knew damn well I couldn't stand seeing you crying. So Truman agrees to see Weizmann. They have a secret meeting in March of 48, right, two months before the end of the mandate, and it goes very well. They meet for over an hour. Now, did Weizmann convince Truman to recognize the state of Israel? Now, we don't have minutes of that meeting, but clearly he helped diffuse some of the president's own misgivings, especially with the pressure that, is, that had been put upon him by George Marshall and by the State Department. So uh, let's uh, take a look at a um, couple of uh, pictures. This. Okay. All right. Share the screen on this. Um, here we go. Famous photo. This is not from that secret meeting in 48. This is from um, maybe 1950. And here is uh, Weizmann. He has already been appointed, been elected first president of the state of Israel. And he brings a Torah uh, to Harry Truman, who certainly uh, you know, appreciated that gift given his appreciation of all things biblical. Now here is, okay, whoops. Another photo, I'll share. Uh, this is from, uh, this next photo is from 1951. Um, here we go. All right. Now there's of course, you know, you have to recognize David Ben-Gurion giving a, a Hanukkah menorah to uh to truman and the the uh the fellow uh to the right is abba Iben, right who was israel's foreign minister at the time a nice photo of harry truman in the oval office with um uh david ben gurion and abba Iben. So um, I'm going to uh, play a video. Very, this is again another very brief video. Uh, this is um, this is Truman talking about the establishment of the state of Israel. Okay, let me make sure. Yep. Okay. 
that decision to recognize Israel as an easy one. I had to make... 1549. But don't think that decision to recognize Israel is an easy one. I had to make a compromise with the Arabs and divide Palestine. The Jews wanted to chase all the Arabs into the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River, and the Arabs wanted to chase all the Jews into the Red Sea. And I was trying, what I was trying to do was to find a homeland for the Jews and still be just with the Arabs. But when you go into a thing of that kind, the people you help most are the ones that get most angry with you. Both of them were against me on the situation, but as President of the United States, I paid no attention to them, carried out what I thought was right, and I had the support of the Congress, and I could do it, which is unusual in these days. Could you tell us specifically that a lot of Jewish people were against you, too? Well, oh, well, there were a lot of Jewish people against me because they wanted the whole of Palestine. As I say, they wanted to drive all the Arabs into the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm not sure about that, uh, Mr. President. But um, there you go. And, 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 you know, Tigris and Euphrates, I don't think um, anybody uh, um, part of uh, the Haganah or later the IDF was looking to to drive Arabs into the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, in Iraq. Um, but okay, uh, not all of his facts are, uh, and, and also he's, uh, this is much, much later, a little bit elderly. Um, maybe he's remembering things differently. I, I don't know. Uh, but it's not, you know, again, um, Truman was not always the, um, he was not a great diplomat and um, was, um, was probably a, a, a more successful president than a politician. FDR was a great politician. That doesn't necessarily, it's not always, I, I don't mean that as a compliment either, necessarily. So um, even though, you know, so Truman does, support Israel. It is the first, we are the first country to recognize the state of Israel. 11 minutes after the uh, declaration of uh, Israeli independence is read um, uh, in, in Tel Aviv in 1948. Um, but Truman did accede to pressure from the State Department and the British Foreign Office to maintain and place an arms embargo on all belligerents, but all belligerents really affected <laughs> the Jews, right? Because you had sovereign Arab states able to purchase arms from wherever you know, they wanted to, um, even if they couldn't get it from the States. And the British, um, British had a number of, of uh, treaty obligations to furnish a defensive aid to countries like Iraq and Jordan that had been, um, you know, there under their vassalage that had been, you know, uh, colonial possessions of uh, Jordan, actually in Iraq, I, I suppose, were mandate possessions. So Britain, um, as long as there was some a guarantee that they wouldn't be used in Palestine, they continue to furnish uh, the Arab regimes the governments um, with weaponry. The United States had a complete embargo. Um, if you're interested, there's a book by Leonard Slater called The Pledge. It came out a bunch of years ago. I want to say it came out in the 60s. Uh, but it details the, uh, the behind the scene efforts to supply uh, Israel with arms and how um, they and they worked, uh, you know, how they worked the embargo illegally. Oh, what's happening here? Sorry, that's Harry. Uh, sorry. Okay, I guess Harry still had something he wanted to say. 
Uh, but uh, Leonard Slater's The Pledge talks about uh, how um, Israelis, with the help of various American Jews, circumvented the embargo. Uh, and a lot of weaponry was uh, actually bought, bought from the Czech Republic uh, with the tacit approval, the tacit blessing, not uh, explicit, but the tacit uh, blessing of Moscow. Um, because from February of 1948 on, Czechoslovakia had become a uh, Russian puppet state. So Truman had various close Jewish associates, uh, businessman Abraham Feinberg, who played a pivotal role in fundraising for him uh, when he had an uphill battle to win in 1948. You may recall that famous photo of Truman holding a newspaper, you know, Dewey wins, right? Um, Judge Samuel Rosenman, who served on FDR's and Truman's staff. Uh, he was the uh, speechwriter who coined the term New Deal. Later, he, I mean, he was a lawyer. He went on to become a judge and served as a personal attorney to the Trumans, helped them with their wills. Uh, Truman visited JTS in 1957. He, uh, he was not expected. Um, when Chief Justice Earl Warren got out of the car, uh, Truman, you know, came out as well. He quipped that, um, you know, he'd been promised a good Jewish dinner. Um, and he attended uh, the convocation of JTS, where he particularly enjoyed a lecture on Amos by Professor Shalom Spiegel, right? Keep in mind that, um, again, Truman was uh, um, a, a very close and devoted reader of the Bible. Uh, in 1960, he received an honorary doctorate from JTS. He was also the keynote speaker at a fundraising dinner uh, for the seminary, honoring outstanding American Jewish leaders. Um, and in recognition of the role that Truman um, played with the creation of the State of Israel, if you can see, let me see if I can uh, make that a little bigger. This is a, uh, it says Kfar Truman, Lechvod Mar Harry S. Truman. All right, so uh, Kfar B'nai Harel this is a, um, a town very close to Ben Gurion Airport, uh, renamed itself in 1950 Kfar Truman. Uh, there is also at Hebrew University, a uh, Harry S. Truman Research Institute for the Advancement of Peace. So Truman's name is found on institutions and the name of a, of a town in, in Israel. So the bottom line is, you know, FDR certainly spoke um, a good game. Yes, he, you know, he, he did practice a kind of genteel anti-Semitism. Um, Truman probably had, you know, rougher, more vulgar things to say about Jews. But honestly, if you look at the record, um, FDR did far less for the Jewish people than is presumed. And despite, you know, Truman's flaws, um, he did a lot to the benefit, for the benefit of the Jewish people, whether it involved refugee resettlement in this country or um, supporting creation, the creation of the state of Israel against um, British pressure, Arab pressure, uh, and um, pressure of his own State Department. Hmm. So in the end, it's deeds, not words. I think I can say that Harry Truman uh, may not have been a friend of individual Jews. Um, but in many ways was a friend of the Jewish people. Uh, if you're interested in um, a book, um, I'd recommend A Safe Haven, A Safe Haven, Harry S. Truman and the Founding of Israel. There's some other books out there that are horrible, uh, but, but that one is a good book, A Safe Haven. It's by um, Ronald and Alice Radosh, R-A-D-O-S-H. And the book's in print. Uh, and it's very well researched, but, but that gives you all of the details of, of uh, Truman's relationship with the establishment of the state of Israel.
So I'm going to stop here and um, open up to any questions or comments. Carol and I uh, visited the Truman uh, Presidential Library in Independence, Missouri. And in a glass case, we saw uh, the handwritten letter from uh, Jacobson to uh, Truman saying, uh, my friend, I haven't asked you anything since you moved into the White House, but this I'll ask you. And that preceded the meeting that you discussed. I thought that you would have a copy of that that you would show us, but it's on oh. on display in the uh, Presidential Library in Independence. Very interesting. And by the way, the name of that hotel across the street from the haberdashery is the Muehlbach Hotel in Kansas City, which is still in business. Muehlbach. Huh, okay. Same. Thank you. I didn't Same. realize that uh, mm -hmm. you uh, you knew you knew Kansas City. Was that just from that visit, or you? Uh... Well, there, there used to be an Air Force base there called Richards Cabauer Air Force Base in Independence, Missouri, actually. And I lived there for a few years. I sponsored a AZA B'nai B'rith youth group there, and and so forth. So I've got ties to Kansas City. Very nice. Well, um, thank you. Okay. George uh, Roy. So wasn't there something about the, the actual UN vote for the, the US passed until and, until we until certain uh, countries voted and then we voted near the end, something like that? Well, um, you know, we, we were at the end of the roll call just because of the United States starts with you. Um but, I mean, it was not necessarily clear that it was going to pass. It was um, something of a nail biter. There were a lot of non-committals. Uh, a lot of, um, there were abstentions. Um, obviously, there were those who voted against. Um, so there was a lot of behind the scenes, you know, politicking. Um, but Truman had made it, you know, clear uh, that he supported partition. The fact that the United Nations, that this had been a recommendation from the UN itself. Um, later on, the State Department, by the way, tries to derail this partition, tries to postpone it. Uh, the State Department has had a long history in the 20th century, anyway, of, um, of, of not necessarily being um, solicitous or mindful of causes that are beneficial to Jews uh, abroad. I'll put it that way. Uh, less charitably, you know, anti-Semitism. <laughs> Marty. Uh, I just remember one of the factors that Truman, that led Truman to recognize the state of Israel was that he was assured that uh, it was not going to be necessary to use uh, American troops to uh, defend uh, Israel, that they weren't going to be involved in that. And that's what he was ensured. He did not want to have American troops sent over there. And they said, no, that would not be necessary to defend ourselves. You know, so. Right. Well, they also, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, pressure to try to get uh, <clears throat> the U.S. to lift the arms embargo. Um, and, they they and, really said, uh, "Give us the arms; we'll defend ourselves." Right. But the U.S. And, didn't and, give them the arms. Americans went over there to fight illegally, including most of their uh, Israeli Air Force for World War II American uh, pilots. Yes, there were, uh, uh, and not all of them were Jewish, but uh, a bunch of them were. If you uh, next time you can go to, uh, I don't know if it's still there, but um, at Hillel in Gainesville at UF, there was a, uh, a display about Americans who had served in the IDF uh, during, during the War of Independence. And uh, it, was, it was a fascinating, um, it seemed to be a permanent exhibit, but it's, but it's been a number of years, but they had all sorts of fascinating memorabilia um, as well. But look, in the end, I mean, um, it wasn't Americans, it was Israelis, Israeli Jews who defended themselves. Um, you know, as, as uh, Golda Meir uh, once said, the secret of our, uh, our strength 
of our, you know, of our military prowess is desperation. We have nowhere to go. Yeah. Our back is against the sea. So, go ahead, um, Sophia. Yes. Hi. Just wanted to find out the difference between the Balfour Agreement and the uh, Israel in '48 at the inception. What well, the, was all the difference? Balfour Declaration said was that. Um, um, his Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a Jewish home, a national Jewish home in uh, Palestine, so long as it didn't upset Arabs. I see. And so long as it didn't in any way um, imply that Jews would, would no longer be citizens of the, uh, the, the diaspora countries in which they had citizenship. Uh, it was a nice statement um what was its exact force that's been debated i mean when it was written um the british weren't even yet uh, in control they would shortly be in control of palestine they would you know conquer it from the uh the ottoman turks um but it you know what is a national national home that term has no you know international legal standing. It sounds nice, but the Israel's Declaration of Independence in 1948 was a declaration of independence. It was, uh, um, you know, based on the partition plan. I mean, the irony is that the Arabs had accepted it. Israel would be a much smaller country today. But, um, but they went ahead and declared their independence. And of course, uh, a day later, um, you had seven Arab armies invade. Was there a, um, Don? Yes, uh, uh, Rabbi, uh, the late Al Schneider uh, of Jacksonville uh, told me a story of his participation after World War II, you know, when, when the when in the, in the War of Independence, that uh, he was going to law school, and um, you know he was active in the Jewish activities, and uh, he and a bunch of his friends were notified one afternoon that that night, uh, if they showed up in an airfield, private airfield somewhere near Gainesville, that uh, there would be an airplane there and a truck would arrive with armaments on it. And they were to load the plane with the, off the truck. And so, you know, all the young, all the young boys from, from the war and stuff were going to school in Gainesville. They went over there and loaded, that, loaded up the plane, taking ammunition, flying it over ammunition and weapons over to Israel. Yeah, there were all sorts of uh, under the radar um, attempts to do that, and I mean, it was it was very much illegal. They would have been confiscated, yeah, and potentially uh, the people prosecuted. Um, but again, if you read uh, Leonard Slater's The Pledge, that's a whole story of of the embargo and the effort to circumvent it. Um, yes, Doctor Canner, you want to? Uh, you're on mute, so uh, can't hear you. Yeah, what can you say about Colonel Nick D. Marcus, who was an American colonel, went over to Israel and apparently became the first Israeli general, uh, what his role was. And uh, it's not clear how he died. Was he actually uh, shot uh, uh, by mistake or were some of the Israeli uh, army generals upset with him and uh, assassinated him? I don't, uh, I, I think the, the, the simple truth is that he was mistakenly shot. Um, people get killed by friendly fire. He certainly was not there as, uh, as a representative of the US government. He had to uh, completely resign and he severed all of his ties um, because you know, otherwise he, would've, he was, would've been cashiered out of the army. 
Uh, but he was also very instrumental in um, building what was called the Burma Road, right? West Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you know, had, uh, Jews had managed to, um, uh, you know, seize and remain in place. They were hoping to keep both the, uh, the old and, you know, the, and the new cities to make Jerusalem the capital. But they were cut off. The road, uh, there was only one road uh, in and out of Jerusalem, very mountainous. If you've ever gone um, on Route 1, um, that follows the traditional route. If you see, you know, you'll see burned out vehicles from um, War of Independence uh, along that highway. Um, there's a newer way into Jerusalem that was built much, 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 much later uh, that actually goes, skirts the West Bank and ends up near Modain and the shortcut in Jerusalem. But in any event, he uh, built um, what was called the Burma Road, bulldozing. He had, was part of the Army Corps of Engineers and created an alternative way to get supplies into Jerusalem, uh, which uh, enabled the Jews to hold on, not to the old city, but um, at least to, uh, to West Jerusalem. Um, but I mean, you know, I wasn't there, but I have no reason to believe that, uh, you know, he was Probably, uh, he didn't speak Hebrew. Uh, he was shot by uh, a sentry who uh, might well have been off the boat just a few weeks or months earlier and um, died of friendly fire, very tragically. Who, who was this? Colonel, uh, if you ever see a, a movie, Cast a Giant Shadow? <laughs> yes. Okay, with Kirk Douglas. It's based on the story of of uh, of of uh, Mickey Marcus. Oh, okay, right. Not Mickey Mantle. Uh, Marcus Mickey Mantle never went to uh, never went to Israel. Uh, actually, I don't know if he you know, but he never went to fight in Israel. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and a very sad story. Right. Very sad story. Any other questions about Truman? Were we uh, call it, it was quick? fascinating. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I, again, I, I personally, um, I have uh, I, I have a lot of appreciation for what Truman did. That doesn't, you know, that's the thing with, with all presidents is that, you know, we want to have simple, uncomplicated views. <laughs> that, uh, this guy was all good or all bad. And there is no such thing. You know, Truman was um, was also very much of a racist at times, and yet he integrated the armed forces against a tremendous amount of, of pushback from Southern Democrats. And it was the reason why in 48, Strom Thurmond ran an independent candidacy as a, uh, the, 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 as a Dixiecrat, right? There was, so that was something that also took votes away from Truman. Still did it. So it's, it's, yes, prejudiced, yes. Um, uncomfortably so when you read what he wrote, but still, I, I can't uh, deny the, the, all the good that he did, nor should we, even well, though he was politically very, very, very incorrect. And I say that not in a complimentary way <laughs> at all. All right, next time out, we're going to talk about Nixon. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nixon, Golda, and Henry. <laughs> and that's an interesting story. Could be good. All right. I wish everybody a great evening. Delilah Happy Cole. New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Just you. remember, Thank Rabbi, you, uh, the buck stops there. Hey, Don, good to see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Will that be next Wherever week? the buck is. Wherever the buck is. All right. Next week, Thank you, Rabbi. We enjoyed your talk. It was great. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.